So much for anonymity. <laughs> I'm Ryan. I'm alcoholic. Hey, everybody. I just want to take a minute just to take it all in. This is awesome. Before I get started, I just want to thank the committee. And I want to thank everybody involved with this thing. If you were involved in this thing in any way, please stand up. You know, I originally came here to, to serve, to serve Alcoholics Anonymous, to serve the greatest thing in my life. But when I got here, I was, I was fed. I have been fed spiritually this weekend more than I can even explain. My cup runneth over. The energy in this room is palpable. And I think it's our duty as sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous to bring that back to our home groups, bring that back to our districts, bring that back to our area. I just want to thank uh, Sue, Stacy, Robin, Judy. You know, I've, uh, I came here, I didn't know anybody, you know, besides the phone calls they, they called every, every week for a year. <laughs> and, um, but I didn't know anyone. You know, a crazy chain of events happened, and, and some, somehow Judy called me up and said, hey, will, will you come and speak at our convention? And um, it's just been a blessing. You know, I came here and uh, I met 2,000 new family members. You guys have really touched me. You really have. And I just, I'm so thankful and I'm so grateful. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and I just want to thank Lee, too. You know, thank Lee, Lee CDs. You know, yeah, round of applause. You know, speaker tapes have been influential in my sobriety. They have been so helpful for me. Um, I know there's not a lot of pockets of enthusiasm in every state in the United States, right? But Lee can give us mobile pockets of enthusiasm. He can help when no one else can. Now I want to say thank you. Anyone have uh, six months or less sobriety? Raise your hand. Welcome to the greatest show on earth. Let me fill you in on a little secret. The main reason we do this, I know it looks so polished and so nice, and it is, but the main reason we meet here is so that newcomers have a place to come to hear the message of recovery. I know everybody kept coming up to me and saying, oh, you're the spiritual speaker, you're the spiritual speaker. Huh? <laughs> More like the spirituality of imperfection. You know, there's one reason I'm sober today. I found what I was looking for in the bottle. I'm okay. I'm comfortable in my own skin today. I have a power greater than myself. That's the most important thing in my life. I'm accountable. I'm responsible. And I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. So uh, the topic today is actually one of my absolute favorites. You guys are supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> so I'm going to tell my story now. <laughs> I grew up in uh, northern New Jersey. I'm not going to talk too much about my childhood or my drinking, but uh, I did grow up in an alcoholic household, uh, upper middle class family, had everything I needed, not everything I wanted. I had wonderful parents. I have no qualms about my childhood because quite frankly I've worked the steps and it doesn't really matter anymore. 
Uh, but both of my parents are alcoholic. I grew up in an alcoholic household, and every night my parents drank alcohol alcoholically. So from a young age, uh, that's what I saw. And um, it was intriguing, to say the least. I remember distinctly, you know, they'd have little dinner parties and stuff, and uh, I'd be in the TV room watching TV, and they would, they'd be in the dining room just, just laughing, and the music's loud, and they had something I wanted. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know what the magic was they had in those cups. But um, I remember from the, the earliest age that I can remember, I always felt uncomfortable in this world. I always felt awkward, nervous. I had a nervous predisposition to life. I was scared to death. My first, first fix for that was approval. I would do anything if you would like me. I would do anything if you would approve of me. If you like me, I like me. It's true. I excelled in academics. I excelled in sports. I was so afraid to fail. I don't know where that came from, but it was it's deep-seated inside of me. Um, and I didn't even know that was a problem for me until I found the answer to it. I remember my first drink. Um, it was on accident, actually. Um, like I said, my parents are alcoholic, and my father, uh, he liked to drink just vodka on ice in a cup. And... Uh, it was sitting on the kitchen table, and I was probably 10 years old, and uh, I went up, and I just thought it was a glass of water, and I took a big sip of it. And I distinctly remember where I was, what I was doing. What, you know, I remember every detail of this experience. I took the sip, and it went down to my toes. It burned all the way down, and I was disgusted. I was enthused. I was curious. I had never felt anything like that before. I didn't throw up. I didn't gag. I was just standing there with my eyes wide open like this. And I was... <laughs> it was my first spiritual experience. <laughs> I didn't become a daily drinker at 10. I waited a few more years. But, um... <laughs> but I remember, I distinctly remember that experience. Um... And then my story from here on out is uh, just like you've heard a lot of stories spoken, you know. Started to go to middle school, started to go to high school, um, still had that fear of, fear of everything, fear of the world, fear of failure, fear of what you think of me. And I wanted to be accepted and I wanted to be liked. I started hanging out with the older kids and what do the older kids do? And I would do anything if you'll like me. If you guys are drinking alcohol, I'm going to drink alcohol too. And I remember the first time alcohol worked for me. It was the lock and key for me. It opened up my life. The first time alcohol worked, I felt, I felt like I could look the world in the eye. I could wear the world as a loose garment. I wasn't scared anymore. It was the best feeling I ever experienced. And naturally, I don't know about you guys, but uh, if something makes me feel good or feel nothing at all, sign me up. I can't get enough. And I made a decision that day, I'm going to do this as much as I can, as much as possible. And I was probably 15 or 16 years old. You know, I was a freshman in high school. And I loved it. And I, I was off from the races. I never drank normally. Once I put one drink in my body, I can't stop. All bets are off. Even from a very young age. I drank for the effect. I remember uh, my dad, like I said, drinks vodka. And um, when I'm in 16 years old, I'm, I have an empty water bottle in my room, and I'm... Uh, going and, and, and stealing some out of his bottle every night, every night, until I get an, enough, right? Until I get enough. And then I drink it alone in my room. That's the kind of drinker I am. That's 16 years old. And it progresses. It progresses quickly for me. Um, I went to my first treatment center when I was 16 years old. I got caught um, intoxicated at school. And as part of their way to rehabilitate me, I had to go to an outpatient treatment center. And I had to go and get my paper signed. That was my first exposure to Alcoholics Anonymous, 16 years old. I don't remember what the topic was at my first meeting. I don't remember the faces. I don't really remember much. But I do remember this gentleman came up to me after the meeting, and he, he gave me this blue book. He said, kid, whatever you do, don't throw this book away. And he walked away. I'm like, all right, cool, thanks, man. <laughs> I have no idea what he's doing, right? And uh, I don't throw the book away, right? I don't read the book. I don't go back to AA. I don't, I, 
I jump through the hoops of this treatment center and get released back to school or whatever, but I never threw that book away. You know, I kept it on my, you know, underneath my nightstand at, at home, and I, I remember drinking with my buddies, and I'd rest my glass on it, and I'd be like, oh, ha, ha, Alcoholics Anonymous, right? <laughs> but I never threw that book out. And uh, fast forward to August 7, 2022. Uh, this is the book I have right here, and it uh, holds an 11-year medallion. That guy helped me when no one else could. He knew I wasn't ready to get sober. He knew I wasn't ready. He carried the message of the heart to me when nobody else could help me. I didn't throw that book away. Just I didn't throw it away just because he told me not to. That's it. That man will never know what he did for me. You know, and that's what we do here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, this morning I was in line getting coffee, and uh, I don't even know why I wasn't getting coffee. My stomach was upside down, and I was just... I guess it's just a habit, but I was getting a coffee, and I, I bump into to Jimmy and Mary Beth, and, you know, Mary Beth says, oh, you look so nice, and she's just so sweet, and then Jimmy says, uh, no tie? <laughs> it really is a disease of perception. But I want to thank the, the men and women in this room who uh, have scooped me up over the last few days. Uh, I've been nervous, right? I've been scared. I'm scared to death, right? I'm nervous. But you know what? They came up to me. They put their arms around me. They prayed with me. They shared their experience with me. It reminded me when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous. That love never stops. And I didn't know anyone when I got here. <laughs> I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Anyway, back to my story. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I finished this treatment center. I get my paper signed, whatever, whatever. I'm going back. I'm, I didn't want to stop. Right? I'm, I'm 17 years old. I'm in high school. I love it. I'm playing, I'm playing football. I'm popular. I love, I'm drinking. I'm going to parties. I have a pretty girlfriend. My life is, I had arrived. And, um, you know, drinking wasn't all bad at all. I had a blast drinking. I had an absolute blast. Right? I would trade a lot in my life right now to relive 17. It was fantastic. I loved it. Right? Then around 18 years old, I uh, started going downhill again, and I can't stop drinking. I'm, I'm drinking daily at this time. I have a fake ID, and my dad's enabling me, and I'm just drinking around the clock, really. I'm, I'm somehow I'm showing up, and somehow I'm, I'm, I'm staying in school and, and doing, doing okay in school, but I'm just I'm living the drink at this point. It's the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning. I love to drink, and I'm 18 years old, a senior in high school, and I just start having this severe depression and anxiety, and I don't know what's wrong with me, and I can't, I can't leave the house without a few drinks in me, and I'm just, like, go, going off the rocker. And um, at this time, I do my first stint in a psychiatric hospital because I want to kill myself because I can't stop drinking. But at this point, I didn't even know drinking was my problem. <clears throat> I go back to my second treatment center. I stay for a couple days, and I leave. I was overreacting. It wasn't that bad. I was too young. I'm too young. I'm 18 years old. I'm too young. I can't be an alcoholic. 18 to 21 is the same thing on repeat. I'm not going to waste time talking about the problem. We're sitting here. We all know what the problem is. I'd rather talk about the solution. I got out of my last inpatient treatment center when I was 21 years old in New Jersey, and I... Uh, that day, I, I moved to Tennessee. Kingsport, Tennessee, the day I got out, I moved. I was so scared to death. I was scared to death to go back to New Jersey. So I moved to Tennessee with my grandmother, who had about 30 years sober at that time in Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, you can come live with me for free. I said, okay. I have nothing else to do. I'm coming. So I come, right? And uh, she said, you can live with me as long as you want, as long as you go to AA. I said, I'll do that deal. That's fine. I'll do that deal. And I walk into Alcoholics Anonymous my first day, and I look to the right of my home group, my would-be home group, um, and I see a sign that says, Welcome Home. And that's what it's been ever since. Welcome Home. I remember those men in that meeting. They, they came up to me, and they saw that I was new, and they saw that I was scared, and they saw that I was just a shell of a human being trying to get by. 
They put their arm around me. They said, kid, we'll love you till you can love yourself. They told me to keep coming back. No one was telling me to keep coming back at that time. But I kept drinking. I kept drinking. But I knew where to go when I was ready. I'd get 30 days, I'd drink. I'd get two months, I'd drink. And I had this last long debacle. It's not that important, really. But I ended up sitting in my car around 12 o'clock in the afternoon in front of a pawn shop slash liquor store. Yeah, they have those things. It's a smart idea. It's a good business model. And I want to drink so bad, I would trade my soul for a pint of vodka. I don't know what to do. I'm at the turning point. It's talked about in our book. But I know there's a 12 o'clock meeting. Something happened. And I went to the meeting. And um, that was September 28, 2010, and I haven't took a drink since. At that point in my life, I was willing to do anything because I had tried every other way to get sober. Our text describes the things that we try to do to manage this thing. Why do I want to manage it? Because it's still the lock and key for me. I hear one of the circuit speakers, one of those guys say, uh, the reason I let alcohol do to me is because of what alcohol does for me, right? It is the solution to every problem that I've ever had. But at this point, I know that I can't drink alcohol, but I don't know how to stop. And I come to AA, and I give up. I give up. I have a a beautiful first step experience. And I say, I'll do whatever you guys tell me to do. And I think that's the foundation for any long-term sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. All the other steps don't mean anything unless I surrender completely to this process and to a God of my understanding. And that's what I did. You guys told me to jump. I said, how I? I got a home group. I got service commitments. I got a sponsor. I got phone numbers. I got a meeting schedule. And every time that door was open, I was there. Not because I'm some spiritual giant, but I'm 21 years old living in my grandma's house with no job. I'm showing up at AA. You know, but I get a sponsor. It's kind of like asking a dude out on a date. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, for me, it was kind of weird. But you know what? He said yes. I'm a call girl. Hey, Lee, cut that out. Um, Yeah, I I find this guy in a meeting, and he's just like on fire. He's talking about God. He's talking about the steps. He has this this tone of voice in him, and it's just like super enthusiastic. I thought he was drunk at first. (laughs) But uh, I asked him to sponsor me. This guy's crazy, you know? But uh, he said yes. And I'm so thankful I did. That man, that man saved my life. He took me through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous at a rapid pace. He said, listen, you're in between solutions at this point. Your old solution's not working. And you haven't, you haven't had the spiritual transformation necessary for this new solution to work. He said, the only way to get there is through the steps. And I'm so thankful that he didn't tell me to just don't drink and go to meetings and everything will be okay. An alcoholic like me with no solution is a recipe for suicide. But you guys gave me a solution. The 12 steps of AA. You know, and he explained to me what it meant to be an alcoholic. I didn't know what it meant to be an alcoholic. I've been to multiple treatment centers. I've been a psychiatrist. I've been to, you know, good doctors. I didn't know what it meant to be an alcoholic. He explained to me that we opened the book. and We started in the doctor's opinion. and started going through this stuff. And he said, listen, you have a physical allergy to alcohol. Whenever you put alcohol in your body, all bets are off. You don't know how much you're going to drink. 
right? You have an abnormal reaction to alcohol. And that was confirmed by my experience time and time again prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. I can't take one drink. You know, it's the first drink that gets me drunk. There's a guy in my old home group that says, if you're standing on the tracks and the train comes through, what kills you, the engine or the caboose? That makes sense to me, right? First drink gets me drunk every time. But how do I not take the first drink? Because if I just had to not take the first drink, we'd have a one-step program. Nancy Reagan would have been right. A nice delayed laugh from the crowd. Thank you. But no, I can't not drink. <laughs> I have a body that can't drink and a mind that can't not drink. All right, Rich. I'm powerless over alcohol when I put it in my body when I don't put it in my body. It's called the mental obsession. When I'm not drinking, all I'm doing is thinking about drinking. When am I going to get it? How am I going to get it? How am I going to hide it? How am I going to... And my world is consumed with how I'm going to get the next drink. This doesn't make me alcoholic. There's a third component. The most important component, I feel. The spiritual malady. Described on page 52. Called the bedevilments. That's what the spiritual malady looks like in my life. Trouble with personal relations. Prey to misery and depression. Can't make a living. Can't be of real use to anybody else. That's how I felt. That's what makes me thirsty. That's what alcohol fixes. There's only two ways to treat the spiritual malady that I know of. Spirits and a spiritual experience. I tried the first one. I had never tried the second one. And I don't believe in God. <laughs> you guys start talking about God. And you start passing a basket around putting money in. I said, oh, here we go. <laughs> they got me. But you know what? You guys told me I can believe in my own God. I can have my own conception of God. As long as it makes sense to me. That's what our text says. So I did that. My sponsor... My home group or my, or my higher power. There's 40, 50 people meeting twice a day, staying sober. That's way more powerful than I was. I turned my will and life over to them. I did everything my sponsor told me to do. I started getting down on my knees, praying to a God I didn't believe in because I believed in my sponsor. I believed that he had had this transformation. I believed that he had been where I had been and he found the way out. I trusted him, and he never steered me wrong. In its simplest form, steps two and three is a decision and a prayer. But that prayer means nothing until I continue to do the work. How do you know you've done a solid, solid and thorough third step? You write the fourth step inventory. After the third step prayer, it says, Next we launched on a course of vigorous action. Not next we thought about it. Not next we discussed it in meetings. Not next we <laughs> launched on a course of vigorous action. The disease of alcoholism centers in my mind, but the process of recovery centers in my feet. I can't think my way out of this. I can't treat the problem with the problem. I had to get busy. I was afraid. I was so scared to look at myself on paper. But I did it. I wrote an inventory. Wrote a resentment inventory out of the big book. Number one offender, right? Wrote a fear inventory. Wrote a conduct inventory. Right? I did all this stuff. And, I, and I'm the type of alcoholic, a perfectionist, and I wanted to get an A on my inventory. <laughs> and I wrote everything I could think of. And I sat down with this gentleman that sponsored me and sit across the table. I'm still at Grandma's house at this time. We're at the Grandma's kitchen table. And, uh, and I started telling him about it. And I started telling him about it. And here's the thing that really solidified it for me. He started telling me about his stuff, too. And at that moment, I didn't feel alone anymore. The weight of the things that I had done 
started to come off my shoulders, and I began to have a spiritual experience. Because at one, at the first time in my life, I could look another man in the eyes, and I felt okay being Ryan. I was starting to have a spiritual experience. I didn't realize it then. I can see it now. The obsession to drink alcohol was gone for me from that point on. When I got honest with another man, And then uh, 6 and 7 came around, and two paragraphs in the big book. I don't really understand it. My sponsor at that time just says, you know what, another decision and another prayer. Are you, are you willing to have the things that you just looked at in your inventory be cast out and removed from you? I said, sure, that sounds like a good deal. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely ready for that. So I got on my knees and I did the prayer. I did the prayer. And then what? I start going up and cleaning up the wreckage of my past. And I'm maybe four, five, six months sober at this time. You know, I'm going to meetings. I'm chairing meetings. I'm making coffee. I'm going out to dinner after the meeting, right? I'm involved in AA. I'm not just working the steps. I'm in every area of the triangle, and I don't even know what the triangle is. (laughs) But you guys put me in the middle. You guys showed me. You guys showed me Alcoholics Anonymous before you told me about Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm forever grateful. (laughs) I know. I'm so thankful we can laugh today. I start cleaning up the past. I'm going to talk a little bit about amends. Um, my father. If anyone's sitting on amends in here, hopefully my story can encourage you to go and get it done. Um, like I said, my father's an alcoholic. He's sick. He's a very sick man. He was a wonderful father, but he's sick. And I had done some things to him that I wasn't proud of. I wasn't the son I could have been. And um, I, I followed the dictates of a higher power and a sponsor, and, I, and I, I redoubled my efforts in the eighth step, and I looked at how I'd harmed him. And I looked at my mistakes. And I went to him, and I made amends. I paid him back the money I stole from him, and I made emotional amends to him, and I had probably six months sober. And he told me he was proud of me. He never got sober. But he always told me he was proud of me for getting sober. He died when I was five years sober. He drank himself to death. But you know what? Whenever I think of my dad, I have no qualms about that relationship. He was the best man that I could have ever asked for. And that's because of the immense process. I don't carry that weight around. I don't carry any of that weight around anymore. It's so freeing and liberating to make amends. Then you guys start telling me about step ten. Continue to take personal inventory when we're wrong. Promptly admitted it. Really, Bill Wilson here is just asking us to take inventory all day long. It's a lot of inventory in AA. <laughs> Quite frankly, I have to look at the same things that I looked at in the fourth step, but I have to look at them constantly throughout the day. The tenth step is a beautiful way for me to get unblocked from God when I try to live on self-will. Because here's something I want to tell you guys. I bet most of you know this, but some of you don't. My life's unmanageable, drunk or sober. The first step doesn't just apply to alcohol. All right. A few awkward slow claps. The longer I stay sober, the more opportunities I have to run on self-will. Right? I think it happens to anyone in Alcoholics Anonymous who stays here any amount of time. I have multiple surrenders in Alcoholics Anonymous. They come about every five years. My first surrender was alcohol. Second and third surrenders have been 
different character defects that are absolutely destroying my life. Sober. And every time that happens to me, my God has to grow and my ego has to shrink. And it's only through pain and suffering for me that I get back to the work. I'm not one of those spiritual giants who voluntarily grow spiritually. I'm not there yet. Maybe I will be. I've heard some guys from here and ladies from up here that just seem like they're up at that level, but I'm not. I grow spiritually as a requirement, not as a desire. Because I don't want to drink again. Um, then, we, then we get to the 11th step, right? And uh... <laughs> The 11th step. It's all through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. Everyone bow their head in the silent meditation. No, I'm just kidding. That would be good though, right? You know, when I first got to AA, I thought it was uh, improve my conscious contact through chairing meetings, through sponsoring guys, through going to the rehab centers through activity. I thought that I could work my way into having a closer relationship with God. But the step is crystal clear. The step says saw through prayer and meditation. Nothing else. Meditation is non-debatable in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're not meditating, you're not in AA. That's a little harsh. (laughs) You're in AA, but... The lights are throwing me off. (laughs) Yeah, this is spiritual for sure. There we go. Yeah! (laughs) All right, let's talk about the nightly review. It's in the 11th step in the big book. It's been one of the most transformational processes in my recovery. I write the nightly review every night, and I send it to the guys I sponsor and my sponsor. I answer the questions in the big book, and I do it, and I send it out, and we all send it out. And it keeps us accountable. It keeps us vulnerable. It keeps us close. You guys taught me how to have intimate relationships with other men. I didn't know how to do that. You guys taught me. And it's one of the most important things in my recovery, how to have a relationship with another man. And I thank you for that. I thank you for teaching me that. And the twelfth step. There's three parts to it. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. The result. We try to carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all of our affairs. When I first got sober, I just thought the twelfth step was just sponsoring guys, right? Sponsor, sponsor, sponsor. That's the fun part of step twelve. That's the part that makes me feel good. Right? There's a prerequisite to that. And it's having had a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. If I don't have a spiritual awakening, I don't have a message that carries depth and weight to share with the newcomer. Working the steps qualifies me to help other men in Alcoholics Anonymous. Practicing these principles in all of my affairs is the hardest part of the step. That's where most of my issues arise today. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I really do. That's my little walk through the steps, right? So uh, I think I'm out of grandma's by this time. I think I got an apartment at this time, right? I got an apartment. I'm waiting tables at O'Charlie's, right? And uh, I'm still doing this thing. I'm involved. I'm at district... I'm going to treatment centers. There is so much work to be done in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's so much more to Alcoholics Anonymous than just sitting in a meeting and throwing a dollar in the basket and leaving. Look around you. I got plugged in. There's so much to be done in AA. 
I didn't voluntarily get plugged in. I was told that I was going to have a job in AA. That I wasn't going to keep taking from this fellowship. That I was going to give back. And that's how I was raised in AA. And I still do that today. I have a, I have a home group with a service commitment. I've always had a service commitment in AA. Because selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my problems. I need to give back to this fellowship that saved my life. So at this time, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about what my life's like today. And I don't want this part of my story to sound like a, a list of my achievements, because it's not that. But it's my duty to show the whole process all the way through. For the newcomer in Alcoholics Anonymous who's sitting in this chair right now, who doesn't know what's going on, who has no clue what's happening right now, who wants to drink, who doesn't want to drink, who's miserable, who's restless, irritable, and discontent, who doesn't think that they can get sober. I'm here to tell you that you can. My life is beautiful today. It is absolutely wonderful. My mom looks at me and she says she's proud of me. <laughs> I remember when she used to look at me with those disgusted eyes. There's nothing worse than a loved one looking at you with those disgusted eyes. I'd rather her yell at me every time. Yell at me, please, but don't look at me like that. She looks at me today and says she's proud of me. I have a wonderful relationship with my family, and it's only because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you people who showed me what to do. I have a wonderful career. I went back to school. My mom's a nurse. I became a nurse. Thank you. And then I've um, been able to serve others as my career, and it's beautiful. And, um, I went back to school again. <laughs> and uh, now I'm a nurse practitioner. I own a home, I own a car, I have a good credit score. <laughs> Life is good. I can't ever forget the way I felt before I came into Alcoholics Anonymous or I'll drink again. I can't take credit for God's work. I can't pat myself on the back up here and tell you these things are from what I did. I took the suggestions and the, the kit of spiritual tools that was laid at my feet. And I put them to use. And my life today is the result. You know, but the material things aren't what make me whole today. The most important thing that I have today is a primary purpose. When I got here, I was just a shell of a human being just trying to survive. You guys gave me a primary purpose. It's to stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. And I'm so thankful for that. A is not my whole life, but it makes my life whole. I stole that from someone, don't it? Mm. <laughs> Half the things I said up here probably stole from speaker tapes. Thanks, Lee. <laughs> I wish I had some cute little way of closing, but I really don't. I don't know how long have I talked, but I feel like I've said enough. I just want to thank you guys again. I love you guys so much. And like I said in the beginning... It's our duty to go back to our groups and to carry this enthusiasm. Yeah, clap for that. We are the future of Alcoholics Anonymous. We have to protect this thing. Thank you for my life. <laughs>